So good morning to everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity. I hope that uh, you will be comprehensive with me. I try to do my best this night <laughs> to prepare uh, this slide. Uh, you will tell me at the end uh, how the result look like. So the topic of uh, my presentation deals with the observation of a superadian phase transition in free space. Uh, this work has been done in the quantum optics team at the Institute d'Optique under the supervision of Antoine Brouis. And in particular, I'm part of the light scattering ex experiment together with Igor Fire barbut and Antoine Glissenstein. And we have some theoretical collaborators, uh, Francis Robicio in Purdue. Okay, so just to give you uh, an introduction. So the interaction between uh, the light uh, and the single uh, two-level atoms is pretty well-known uh, phenomenon. We know, for instance, that if we have a two-level system and we shine a resonant light on it, the system undergoes Rabi oscillation that are described by the optical block equation. And when we switch off the driving, the probability of finding the atom in the excited state will decay exponentially with the time constant, which is given by the line width of the transition that we are using to, to probe uh, the system. However, if we are consider, considering many emitters, the situation is much more uh, complicated uh, because the system behave collectively. And the first seminal works, work uh, that has introduced this kind of, uh, that has tackled this kind of problem is the one of Dickey in 1954, uh, where he has studied the decay of a fully excited uh, ensemble of atoms enclosed in a volume smaller than the wavelength to the cube. And he find out that the light emitted during the decay is very different from an, an exponential decay and it presents this peak that, uh, that is the so-called superradiant burst. I guess that all of you are familiar with the Dickey superradiance, but let me just uh, remind you what is the main idea. Uh, the main idea, even classically, is to use the proper symmetry of the system. So we know that even classically, we can write the Hamiltonian of the system in this way, but since the field experienced by each atom has to be the same because the volume is smaller than lambda to, to the cube, we can factorize it and we obtain an Hamiltonian that is symmetric with, the, with respect to the ex exchange of two atoms. And so the Dickey idea was to exploit this symmetry to introduce a collective spin operator basis and a collective spin state that are known as the Dickey ladder. And in particular, if the, the, the state at t equals zero is symmetric with respect to the exchange of two particles, as the fully excited state is, the system, the dynamics of the system will be restricted uh, only to the symmetric part of the Dickey letter. And this, starting from that, he can evaluate the famous n square scaling of the Dickey superradiance. But however, we can ask ourselves if this is the full story. And indeed, it's a bit more complicated than this. First of all, uh, by an experimental point of view, it's very hard to manipulate an atomic ensemble with the um, below lambda, let's say, uh, due to the diffraction limit. Moreover, when we uh, shine light on a system, this induces a dipole, and this dipole interact between, and the dipole of each atom interact uh, with the dipole of the other atoms. Uh, and this light-induced dipole-dipole interaction, together with this finite site effect, can break this symmetry uh, uh, that is on, on which the, the, the Dickey model is based and coupling the, the superradian part to the other state of the Dickey letter that contains, for instance, the subradian state. Um, moreover, in the, uh, in, the Dickey, uh, in the Dickey model was totally absent the effect of, the, uh, of an external driving, which is another important uh, tool that we have to consider. Um, so if you are interested in this kind of question, we, we have recently explored some of them and you, you can find some references here. Uh, the, the topic of this, uh, of this talk is mainly related to the last point. So what is the effect uh, of an external driving in this uh, Dickey collective picture, let's say. Um, actually, by a theoretical point of view, we already have an answer because uh, about 20 years later, uh, 20 years after the, the, Dickey, uh, the Dickey paper, uh, this gentleman here, um, has introduced this uh, driven Dickey model, 
So basically, under the same approximation that Dickey used, uh, they take into account of an external driving in this collective spin operator basis. And the result is basically given by this master equation uh, that where we can recognize two terms. The first one is the effect of the driving, and the second one is the effect of the collective dissipation. So this is a first ex example of uh, uh, a, a driven dissipative uh, collective system. So why it's interesting, this model? The first point is that it's quite easy to be solved. Uh, so we can solve it up to 50 atoms without any problem using Mathematica. Uh, also, uh, an experimentalist can do it. Uh, and this is fine. But despite this, uh, it predicts not trivial physics. So in particular, it predicts the existence of two non-equilibrium phases, a ferromagnetic one in the weak driving regime, where the system remain in the, in the ground state, even if uh, the system is driven, and a paramagnetic one, where basically the system is cast in an incoherent superposition of this Dicky state. Um, and why it's nice? Because this state, we can analytically show uh, that the photon emission rate in, in this state scales like n squared. So this is uh, a first example of a steady state super radiance. Okay, um, so the, the, what, what I will present you today is, as far as we know, the first experimental observation of this uh, driven Dicky model, this original driven Dicky model, uh, in, uh, in a cavity-free environment. Um, let me introduce our experimental plat platform. Uh, so it relies on four high numerical aperture lenses in a so-called Maltese cross configuration. Uh, we use two of them uh, to create uh, a tiny focus uh, dipole trap, an optical tweezer, uh, where we load up to 2,000 rubidium atoms at a typical temperature of about 200 micro K. Um, then uh, we isolate to hyperfine uh, uh, level, uh, applying, um, performing the experiment in a strong magnetic field, uh, and we drive uh, the, the, the atomic cloud uh, that has these typical sides. So the radial size is smaller than lambda. We can estimate it, we cannot measure it because it's below our resolution imaging, uh, but the axial one is of the order of 20 lambda. Uh, and we drive it along the main direction of the cloud um, using, uh, for all the measurements that I will show you today, using a resonant light. And then we collect the fluorescence emitted by the cloud in two, two different directions, uh, exploiting the two dimensionality, uh, high resolution dimension that, uh, that our set platform possesses. So in general, the photon emission rate of a cloud is given by this relation here where the first term is the photon emitted due to the decay from the excited state, while the second term is the photon emitted via the photon exchange between two atoms. So this second term is related to the correlation uh, hosted in the system. What is nice about our setup is that the two different detectors are sensitive to two different uh, things. In particular, the radial detector, uh, which is perpendicular to the, to the main axis of the cloud, um, in, in this direction, the, the correlation are washed out due to the fact that this cloud is randomly distributed. Conversely, in this direction, the correlation are still present. And to have an intuition, this is due to the fact that in this direction, since the cloud is smaller than lambda, we cannot recognize if we receive a photon uh, from which atom uh, it has been emitted. And, and this uh, makes the, somehow the correlation robust. Uh, and, and we, we can measure, measure them in, in this direction. We have also uh, a spatial filtering, which works quite well, uh, that is used to uh, completely uh, reduce the driving strength, the driving light, sorry, uh, so that what we measure here is just the fluorescence in this direction. Um, okay, before going on, I would like to stress one point. So it's very important to understand uh, what is uh, the coupling of our cloud uh, to uh, a diffraction mode, a generic one? Um, and so it's, it's uh, very important to understand what is the cooperativity of, our, of the emission of our system into this mode. And to have an intuition of it, we can consider this classical approach, let's say, 
So the field radiated by this cloud is given by this relation here. And to compute the power radiated in this diffraction mode, we have to take this, the, the modulus square of this, uh, of this guy, and we have to integrate it uh, over the diffraction angle. And if we do this, we can recognize two different contributions. The first one is the incoherent part of the radiation, which scales with, with n. And the second one is the coherent part, which scales like n squared times the structure factor, which depends on the geometry of the cloud and on the direction of the driving. Then we can define the cooperativity as in a cavity system. Uh, so we can divide the power radiated uh, in, into this diffraction mode by the power n times the power radiated by a single atoms. And we find out that this term is negligible respect with, to this. And we find out that the cooperativity introduced an effective atom number, n tilde, which is n times mu, where mu is basically the integral of the structure factor. And then we can compute it, it uh, knowing the cloud geometry. And what we find out is that mu is 4, 10 to the minus 3 with a larger error bar of 50% uh, roughly. But um, this is what it is. OK. Um, then I'm ready to, uh, OK, so what is the take home message of this part? The take home message is that basically our elongated cloud is somehow equivalent to a system of n tilde atoms that are effectively interacting with a single electromagnetic mode. So it's a bit like a cavity system, but without a cavity. OK, now I'm ready to show you the experimental result. So in the first part, I will present you uh, what we have found about the um, dynamics of excited state population. So measuring the, the photon emitted in the radial direction with respect to the driving and to the main axis of the cloud. And what we have is something like that. So if we are, if we are in the low atom number regime, the dynamics of the system is pretty well uh, represented by the optical block equation, which is the black line, meaning that in this regime, the system is just an ensemble of non-interacting atoms. But as the atom number increases, we clearly see that the oscillation becomes smaller and smaller up to uh, vanish in, uh, in the, for, for, the for the largest atom number that we can have. And note that all this measurement has been done in a deeply saturated regime for a single atom. So uh, I over I sat is of the order of thir it's 35 in this specific, specific measurement. Then, of course, we can uh, extrapolate the Rabi frequency of this, uh, of this, uh, from these traces. And we can plot this as a function of the effective atom number. And we find something like that. Uh, this, uh, the effective Rabi frequency divided by the single atom Rabi frequency. Then we can perform the complementary experiment so we can keep fixed the atom number and we can scan the driving strength. And what we have is that below a critical threshold, basically we don't see any Rabi oscillation. And then the Rabi oscillation appear above a critical threshold here and becomes consistent with the single atom Rabi oscillation, uh, Rabi frequency, sorry, uh, only in the very, very strong driving regime. In order to explain this data, we will make use uh, of the driven Dicke model. So what we have done is to take this master equation, we solve it, and we compare the data uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the theoretical prediction, and we find a pretty nice agreement, uh, almost without using any free parameter. Uh, I, I said almost because uh, <coughs> we have an uncertainty in the rescaling factor for uh, extrapolate and, and tilde, and we use the one within our error bar that match better the, the experimental data. And this is, uh, this is con consistent for, uh, with what we expect, and this is somehow fixed, and will be the same for all the other measurements that I will show you. Okay, so to get an intuition uh, of the reason why this behavior happened, we can, uh, we can use uh, this Divan Dicke model. Uh, and the idea is that the effective uh, driving field that the atoms experience uh, is the sum between the driving and the field radiated by the atoms. This field radiated by the atoms uh, can be written in this collective uh, uh, basis uh, as the expectation value of the collective dipole S minus. 
But since this S minus, since we are in resonance, in the steady state, this S minus is purely imaginary and negative. So the, 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 the I and the minus combine, uh, and we obtain that the effective driving is smaller than the, than the, than the driving one. And this explains why as the atom number, so what does it mean? It means that as the atom number increases, uh, the, the system uh, create uh, um, emit a field uh, which is larger and larger as the atom number increases. Uh, and this field is pi shifted with respect to the driving one and interfere destructively with it. And the neat result is that we have a reduction of the, of the, of the driving strength. And this model is also able to explain this observable here because um, the maximum dipole that uh, a, a given uh, n tilde atoms is able to create is given by n over 2, where, the, where we are in the coherent superposition of the Dicke state uh, in the equator. Um, and so it means that if our driving is larger than this critical value, which is this one, we will expect some oscillation and above this, the effective driving field is basically zero. And this explains also this curve here. And moreover, as we increase the driving strength, the collective dipole is reduced. This is what, what we expect from also from a single atom that in the very strong driving regime, the, 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 collective, the, the, the dipole goes to zero. And this is why we recover in this limit that the effective driving Rabi frequency is equal to the, oops, to the, um, to the driving one. Then we move our attention to the steady state properties of this driven dissipative system. So what is the natural scale to describe the system is given by this parameter beta, which is the ratio between the driving and the field radiated by the maximum field that uh, the system can radiate, which is n over two. Okay, and if we plot the steady state value of the number of excitation hosted in the cloud measured radially and of the photon emission rate in the superradiant mode measured axially as a function of beta, we found these two curves here, um, which, which again, again agree quite well with experimental data. So these are not fit. Um, and here, for instance, we can recognize the two phases that I have uh, introduced at the beginning of my talk. So in the, in the weak driving regime, we have these ferromagnetic states, so the system is, is still in the ground state, even if it's driven, uh, and it's driven above the, the single atom saturation. Uh, while the system enter in this saturated paramagnetic phase uh, for a large driving. Moreover, uh, we find out that, uh, as we can see here, um, the critical point is beta equal one, and we find out that the, the crossing over between these two phases becomes steeper and steeper as the atom number increases. And this is the observation of the onset of a superradiant phase transition that is expected, of course, in the thermodynamic limit. But, but still, we, we can see something uh, uh, by, this, uh, by, by these different trends. And this is basically what has been predicted like uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, in this paper here. We can have the same, uh, the same kind of behavior looking at the photon emitted in the superradiant mode. And this is somehow equivalent to what uh, uh, has been done in the cavity system, for instance, in Tillman Esslinger group, where they saw that. Uh, uh, below a critical pumping uh, strength, there was no photons in the, super, in, the, in the cavity mode, and above it, the, the, the cavity mode get macroscopically populated. So it's a bit like this. Here, we don't have any photons in the superradiant mode. Here, we have a macroscopic population of it. Um, okay, and then to benchmark uh, the superradiant nature of these. Uh, paramagnetic uh, saturated uh, phase here. Uh, what we have done is to study the dependence uh, uh, on N of it. So basically, uh, we set the driving strength and we tune the atom number and we measure the steady state value of the photon emission rate and we uh, fit it with the polynomial uh, power of N and uh, we find out that the system um, in the strong driving regime uh, scales quadratically with the atom number, the photon emission rate in this axial mode, while 
uh, the system uh, in the low in the linear uh, in the low driving regime scales linearly with them, and this is somehow the the crossing over from the normal or ferromagnetic state to the super radiant one uh, that happens smoothly in our case, and uh, so the value of beta equal one is more or less at, at s uh, equal to 50. Sorry for that, uh, didn't fix it, um, and so. Uh, would that, and, and to have an intuition again, I just want to remind you that in this regime, we have a macroscopic population of the most super radiant state of the Dicky letter, and this gives rise to the n square scaling uh, of the emission. And this is, as far as we know, uh, sorry, the first e experimental evidence of steady state super radiance in a cavity free environment. Um, finally, uh, since the super radiance is originated by uh, the correlation in the system, it is natural to ask ourselves uh, if uh, uh, these atomic correlations are somehow imprinted in the, in the statistic of the light emitted by the cloud. And so we, we, we measure it, and we measure it using a number of brown twist experiments. So we take our, uh, the photon emitting in the super radiant mode, we split it in two using a beam splitter, and we, uh, and we correlate the, the click uh, of our uh, photodetector. And what we have found is that uh, the two different regimes possess two different statistics of the light emitted. So basically, if, if we are in the ferromagnetic phase, uh, the light emitted by the system is coherent. Note that we are pretty sure that it's, we are filtering the driving. So it means that somehow the statistic of the, dri of the driving is imprinted to the stati statistic of the light emitted uh, by the atoms. While if we are in the uh, paramagnetic phase where the system oscillates, we observe uh, an, obs an oscillation also in the, in the measurement of the G2. But surprisingly, uh, both the cases violate what is expected from, uh, for, uh, for a non-interacting ensemble of atoms where the Sigurd relation holds. And this is manifested, for instance, in this anti-correlation dip that we have, that we go below one. Uh, we don't have a clear explanation of, of, of this behavior that we observe. Uh, we find out some theoretical papers in cavity uh, where the, they claim that this might be related to the population of subradiant mode. We don't know. We want to do some experiment to, to see if there are some correlation between this anti-correlation dip uh, and subradiance, but uh, this is really ongoing uh, experiment, so I, I, I don't have a, a final uh, uh, point on it. But interestingly, we find out also that, uh, we find quite nice that the, the, the different phases possess these different statistics, and also using uh, the, the, the statistic of the light, we can somehow uh, observe the two different phases predicted by the system, and in particular, we saw that the uh, by plotting, for instance, G2 of zero, that it moves from one in the ferromagnetic state to a finite value. Um, and this, uh, this behavior is predicted by the driven Dicke model, even if in this case we don't have a quantitative, a quantitative agreement with respect to it. But as I told you, this is pre preliminary, so we want to double check uh, also all the experimental uh, systematics and so on. Yes. Um, Okay, I move to the conclusion of my talk. Uh, so the first point is that um, basically, uh, and I think that it's the, the main result of this, uh, of this presentation, uh, is that uh, uh, even if we, we have a cloud which is not in the, in the Dicky limit, uh, this is uh, uh, the dynamics of the system and the steady state properties of the system uh, is formally equivalent to uh, a, a system of an effective atom number and tilde in the Dicky model. Um, and, and, to, to, and this is uh, supported by the experimental uh, data that we have uh, measured for the dynamics of the excited state and by the observation of the, of the two different phases predicted by, uh, by, the, by the model um, and by the observation of uh, steady state super radiance. Um, and we have also measured the correlation of the light emitted by uh, by the cloud, uh, we saw something that goes beyond mean field that is not, cannot be explained by uh, the, the cigar relation, let's say. 
uh, but uh, uh, as I told you, this is uh, really ongoing. Um, what is the outlooks? But first, first of all, it would be very nice to understand why uh, we can use this driven DQ model. Let's say starting from the uh, from the real uh, master equation of the system. What what are the approximation that leads to this uh, driven DQ master equation? The experiment seems to suggest that there should be a way, but we don't know uh, which one it is. And the other perspective that we have is uh, to try to understand if the paramagnetic phase that we realize is somehow, can be considered somehow as a super radiant laser. And for do this, we are planning to realize an experiment to measure the spectrum of the light emitted to see if the, if, if the bandwidth becomes smaller as the atom number increases. And then uh, I'd like to thank you for the attention and thanks to my collaborators. <laughs>